Hello, um, good afternoon everybody. This is an NFE talk and the topic is increasing uh, infrastructure efficiency via optimized NFE pl placement in OpenStack clouds. And our team, so I'm Ramki from Brocade City office and here we have Debo uh, from uh, Cisco City Cloud City office and Yeti from Cisco Cloud City office. And our goal is to drive uh, innovative open source solutions for specifically for NFE uh, with OpenStack. So what does this talk about? You might have um, heard Toby Ford uh, from at and talk about NFE a couple of days back on um, Tuesday 13th. Um, the key message he, want, um, he would like to deliver is you know, these. Essentially, the worlds of IT and telco are uh, converging together. And uh, the telco cloud, for the telco cloud, open stack is the infrastructure foundation. And with that, our goal is to transform um, you know, open stack to a carrier grade uh, NFE uh, uh, cloud solution. And uh, we'll deep dive into uh, some high level gaps it's to be identified. And we also plan to demo some initial progress on this front. So with that, uh, the agenda for today is quick NFE summary. I mean, focus on a specific cloud NFE use case. And um, our goal is to drive some innovative ideas through uh, efficient uh, resource placement strategies. I'll propose some extensions to OpenStack Scheduler to achieve this, and a quick conclusion. So what is NFE? Um, Network functions virtualization is a global movement by network operators, AT&T, Verizon, uh, BT, you know, operators all over the world, not limited to just United States. So the idea is to transform from the classic network, like uh, network appliances, say hardware-based firewalls, BRAS, into a virtualized network appliances which can run on general purpose hardware you know, Intel-based or, you know, ARM-based, uh, anything, and drive operational OPEX and CAPEX savings. And um, also, not just that, it's also the increased automation uh, which would drive, um, by the use of virtualized appliances, which would drive OPEX savings and also faster time to market. Uh, besides OPEX and CAPEX savings, the operator's goal is also to uh, enable new business models and value-added services. And as you can see, if you're virtualizing uh, an equipment like BRAS, uh, that means you're also touching something like a telco central office. So it's no more just the large-scale data center game. In fact, your uh, central office is becoming a small data center. And also, some operators are looking at data centers uh, you know, the uh, base station, mobile base station, those really mini data centers. So with NFE, you can see that the data centers are, are stretching much beyond the current definition of the large scale or hyperscale data centers to the distributed data centers like central offices or, uh, you know, data center, the base station. And that's the interesting, uh, you know, angle in which uh, things are proceeding with NFE, which is quite different from your classic uh, hyperscale data centers. Now, let's look at a specific uh, NFE use case, uh, NFE infrastructure service. So the motivation is, uh, primary motivation is network functions in the cloud. So today, you must know quite very well about this infrastructure, classic infrastructure service, which is offered by cloud service providers. And um, essentially, it's um, uh, and it's about compute and storage, opened up compute and storage model. And uh, network as a service, which is offered by service providers, uh, which is focused on WAN. And um, the whole goal of combining both with NFE is, uh, you know, trying to um, leverage, uh, for example, NFE infrastructure of another service provider and increase resiliency, reduce latency, 
uh, for CDN use cases and also address regulatory requirements, especially for energy efficiency. So if you look at where we are today with such a service, compute and storage are treated independent of network and there are no energy efficiency considerations. So this means it's just, you know, just randomly just combining them and calling it NFEIAS without maximizing the service value because it's still not anything joint. It's disparate but, you know, combined in a single name. And with that, just wanted to quickly get into what this NAS is. Some of you may already be uh, familiar with this. So, if you look at essentially um, what NAS is, network as a service, one of the common use cases is about uh, bandwidth on demand across van. In a sense, if you have some uh, workloads like disaster recovery or on-demand backup, so instead of dedicating bandwidth across van, essentially the idea is, you know, kind of do dynamic allocation of bandwidth when bandwidth is really needed and then release it later. And the big advantage is, you know, since van bandwidth is precious, you can achieve substantial bandwidth savings, especially for elastic jobs like backup or DR. That's the primary benefit. And uh, typically MPLS is used for achieving, uh, doing bandwidth on demand. And now, so with NFE IAS, I give you an overview and uh, you know, essentially how compute and storage is still treated decoupled from network. So in this model, so let's see where we really want to get to in this, to extract the combined value. So we want to get to somewhere much beyond band bandwidth savings and essentially get to a model of optimal resource placement across uh, data centers. And like I said, it's not just the large scale data centers, hyperscale data centers, even the distributed smaller or mini data centers in the edge of the network. And the goal is to uh, increase energy efficiency while maintaining multi-tenant fairness and improving performance. And this would drive ca capex and opex savings, improve uh, quality of e experience, and address regulatory requirements, especially for energy efficiency. And the popular use cases are, you know, on uh, disaster recovery, on-demand backup across van, and you know, virtualized CDN, especially content pre-positioning, where we want to make sure that uh, you know, well, the content is closer to the user at the data center, uh, which is very close to the edge. Essentially, if you're keeping uh, content in a mobile base station, it's proximal to the user, uh, and uh, you can improve the qual quality of experience. So. In this, uh, for specifically for NFE IAS, let's look at some of the energy efficiency issues today. So if you look at uh, power usage in data centers, and especially as we are transforming to NFE, it's all about servers. And servers are the biggest consumption of uh, energy. And if you look at uh, server power profiles, as you can see here, um, they're heavily nonlinear. The 45% of peak power, you know, with 25, 20 percent of offered load, and notably, the biggest one, uh, you know, is around the uh, idle state. Sorry, um, where you can see that approximately one third of the power is being consumed in the active idle. So, this fundamentally means that. It's extremely inefficient to keep servers powered on under low load conditions. You know, if you have nothing to do in a server, uh, it's good to just power it off rather than keeping it in active idle, uh, you know, waiting to receive load. So, and this is all uh, clearly depicted here. You know, what I talked about, these numbers are from spec uh, benchmark results for a, a HP ProLine server. So this issue is, uh, you know, quite public and well known. So 
So I'll hand it over to Debo to, you know, who'll explain on how we get that with OpenStack and the huge opportunity. Thanks, Ramki. Uh, so, uh, uh, as Ramki has mentioned, all the NFV use cases and how the, how optimization, optimized resource placement is getting important. In fact, Toby Ford also mentioned that in his talk. So. Uh, so all that is from a very high level perspective, we know the requirements, that these are the things that we need to do as a community within OpenStack. But how do we get there? Um, and the way we get there is taking very small steps. But before take, telling you what, the small, what are the small steps that we've taken, um, I'd like to uh, consider the following workflow. For example, if you were trying, uh, say there is an application that's uh, sitting on top of an NFV solution. And typically, uh, the NFV solution will have its own API, which we will not get into because it's at a much higher level uh, compared to OpenStack. And if you look at the diagram to your uh, right-hand side, th there'll be a lot of components of the NFV solution. One of the components is a infrastructure uh, virtualization layer where OpenStack is poised to play a hu huge role. In fact, it's one of the most commonly um, depicted uh, block. So imagine uh, now, now imagine a customer, NFV customer, submits a job request, say a backup with some kind of constraints on el uh, elastic, uh, elastic, uh, elasticity windows and other constraints. There could be many constraints, network constraints, business constraints, different rules. And you have to encode these constraints in a, a reasonable format. Ob obviously, all those questions are still open. But eventually, what happens is it traverses through this uh, stack, and uh, then it goes to the OpenStack API, namely the scheduler. The op uh, it could be the OpenStack API, which would then hand, it over, hand over the request to the scheduler API. And the scheduler API, say, assume that we have a fancy uh, scheduler called the solver scheduler. We'll talk about it in great details. What, the, uh, what, the, what this fancy uh, scheduler needs to do is the following. It needs to figure out a very, uh, um, uh, basically, it, uh, it needs to figure out what is the system state. Um, and once it figures out what the system state is, it makes an intelligent decision on where the resources should be placed, and not only where, but even when the resources should be placed. Because suppose you're trying to uh, schedule a backup, it's sometime in the future. And then it uh, collects, once it's decided the exact schedule, it returns back to, to the NFV business logic the, uh, in the provider, and the provider then sends back to the um, uh, NFV customer. Now, as a side effect, it could also trigger other events. For example, it could trigger an entire workload that would finish one job and start the next based on timing. It could also uh, uh, trigger events that will power down certain servers and so on and so forth. But essentially, what needs to be done in OpenStack is, I mean, the, the simplest thing that you, uh, we need to do as a community is to ensure that the NFV applications uh, stack can actually dictate its requirements to OpenStack in a, in a meaningful way. So we need a very crisp definition of the API, uh, the contract, or the uh, contract between the NFV layers and the virtual infrastructure layer. That is absent today. Once you have the contract, uh, I mean, in addition to the contract required, you would like to figure out a way how you could have a smarter scheduler that can actually consume the, these requirements uh, of the NFV layers and uh, do intelligent placement of workloads. And I think in that particular um, uh, step, we have some uh, th things. I mean, in fact, that we've shown that you could do smart scheduler in OpenStack even with existing, uh, the, even with existing uh, Nova, uh, like pre, uh, even an ice house and uh, that without uh, disrupting the architecture. In fact, we could not only do smart scheduler, we could do smart scheduler using cross services, using both network storage and compute constraints. And we'll go over some of that. Uh, in fact, when we presented this in um, the previous summit, there was a lot of interest. However, the killer app was still not very clear to the community. I feel that now we see a, a real killer app. 
And uh, uh, essentially what we would like to do is to have a smart scheduler in OpenStack that will use analytics, possibly big data analytics if your uh, entire system is uh, large scale and distributed, to determine the current state of the OpenStack deployment. And once you know the current state, um, then you, uh, you will, uh, we use uh, um, resource management techniques or like optimization, et cetera, to pick up resources based on the constraints uh, that the application has given us through the API, which today doesn't exist, but assume that API exists, and uh, the s current system state. So that's the, our goal. And in the, in the scheme of things, what we have done today is we have, uh, uh, we have the uh, a smart scheduler that uh, my colleague Yati is going to talk about. And we've uh, pushed in, uh, the, for this some, uh, release, we have an API extension called Innova called the server group, which we believe that we can expand and uh, encode a bunch of these constraints. So with that, Yati. Hi, thanks, Tevo and Ramki. So going forward, uh, as a, as a possible uh, solution uh, that we can uh, use to address this uh, uh, use case uh, of NFE, we propose this, actually we propose this uh, in the ISOS Design Summit and uh, we are actually uh, working, it's an ongoing work. So to give you an idea, what we need is a smart uh, resource placement engine which can actually take in this request from the top. So, and in terms of tenant APIs, what I mentioned here as rules and policies, what I mentioned is like all the, cust all the NFE consumer requests that come in using a clear cut, clearly defined API, those, those rules and policies, whatever is requested from the top needs to be translated into uh, some sort of constraints which will be used along with the global states. And this global states could be, we could also use, uh, like Debo mentioned, we could use some analytics to get derived some of these metrics. And in addition to that, what we need here, which is currently lacking, is, is a way to do cross services. So what we want is, is constraints that include network, storage, compute, energy, etc. So you want, we want to unify the constraints so that we can come up with an optimal decision. So all these kind of feed into this smart placement engine. And uh, what we propose here is that we can use really fast implementations of Apache license third party uh, solver libraries so that we can, we can actually compute this uh, ultimal, uh, optimal uh, placement. And to give you more details, what we propose is, is the solver scheduler. So this as an intelligent placement engine. So to give you an idea, a user, what we're trying to do is is actually to maximize performance or to minimize all the costs. So if we define this as a mathematical problem using all these various costs that you want to minimize and various constraints that come from network, compute, storage, energy, we want to ultimately use this smart engine to come up with a scheduling decision for optimal placement of resources. And we can use the various energy profiles, server states, and the network link capacities and the system capacities as all that feed into making this computation. So this is our uh, brief idea, and it is very complex. So uh, this is an example of how a, how a really smart mathematical uh, problem looks like. So I don't want to bore you guys and get into the details of this, but just to give you an idea, this is what we're trying to say about smart placement. So going in the next uh, two minutes, I think I'm going to show you a quick demo. So we, uh, we actually use the scenario of uh, compute and storage affinity as one of the requirements to make optimal placements as a, as a use case here. And comparing it to NFE use cases, this could be very much applicable for backup services or CDN services where you want to place the service VM close to the storage. So in this particular setup that I have here, uh, imagine there are, there are three hosts there and two of the hosts in, the ra in one of the racks has these volumes uh, installed, uh, the demo volume one and demo volume two. And I'm trying to place a request to say no, I'm making a, making a compute request here. So I want to create two VMs. So I, I'm placing a request saying that, uh, give me two VMs which are close to these volumes. So that is what I'm going to show here. And let me quickly show you with the help of a, a small demo video that I have here. So what I have here is, a, is an OpenStack DevStack installation and uh, I have the three hypervisors there, host one, host two, host three. This is my uh, set of servers that I have where I can instantiate VMs. And I need two VMs and the set of volumes that are there are demo volume one and demo volume two, they are located in host two and host three. 
like I see. So what I want to see is that can, can I place a request for two VMs which will ultimately get placed close to or on exactly those hosts so that it's, it's really near, the compute and storage are really near. That is the constraint that I feed into my engine and make a request. So this is a working implementation of a scholar schedule integrated with NOAA without much changes to architecture. This is, I'm making a NOAA boot request here for two VMs and now as you can see here, the VMs get placed in those two hosts. The two instances created are actually on those volumes where I had requested in the, in the NOAA boot request. So yeah, like, like, like I said, I think uh, what we, what, this is just an example of how uh, we can specify a constraint to our uh, solar scheduler and compute, affinity, compute storage affinity is just one of the examples, but we can use energy and all, the, all of this is ongoing work in our team and we are exploring all these options. But this is just to give you a flavor of how a smart scheduler can unify all the constraints across compute, storage, volume, energy and uh, other constraints to give a complete one set of optimal decision. So to conclude, what I would like to say is that NFV is really a killer use case for OpenStack and uh, what I would like to request here is that we have actually proposed a blueprint for Solar Scheduler and I would like to drive this and use this NFE use case as a, as, as a way to kind of uh, work with the community and try to get this forward. And as a, as a matter of fact, like Debo mentioned, we have already pushed code for Server Group API which, which actually is the first step towards defining APIs which lets you make this uh, complex request with all these constraints and policies defined so that you can actually come up with a group of uh, uh, servers that you can scheduled together. And in addition, we, we should also look at all the neutron hooks, which will give us the network related uh, constraints for making an optimal decision. I would like to conclude here and uh, open up the, uh, for our questions. Can you come to the microphone? Uh, yes, hello. So, this uh, constrained optimization, does it have an exposed interface so people can tune it or write their own? Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that it is there. So you can actually tune in to feed in constraints, feed in costs. So you can actually feed in your own set of constraints to complete, uh, ultimately solve the problem. And it will work in, uh, inside the NOVA scheduler. NOVA doesn't realize that we've actually shipped the decision making to the solver. NOVA just thinks that it's the same old scheduler. Right, and this is Keshav from HP. I mean, uh, what are the NFV that uh, you are targeting? Because there's a carrier grade NFV entities like a NAT or a VLR, HLR, which are on a dedicated hardware. Whereas when you come to the, on, in the open stack, you are, I mean, you still sit outside the, uh, outside of our and try to commit, communicate through some other way to open stack or you will sit inside the open stack as a VM? No, so uh, we uh, assume that the NFV business logic is on top of open stack. Okay. So the business logic uh, uh, encodes the constraints and makes an uh, uh, open stack API call. Okay. And the API call then translates those into scheduler constraints or a scheduler API. Okay, so you are not going to fit in the inside the open stack framework. So we are, I mean, the schedule I mean, Because, I mean, currently the, the kind of uh, HA requirements or the service upgradation kind of requirements, what the carrier grid will have. So, uh, so I agree. The, uh, maybe we should discuss this offline, but for a large class of uh, constraints that okay. are posed by the NFV use cases, we believe that we can encode them into uh, optimization constraints and then solve it uh, and place up optimal resources. But there may be one or two edge constraints. Yeah. That we may not be able to cover. I think that's exactly we are trying to solve a constraint based uh, optimization rather a framework for you know constraint based optimization and NFE as a use case right right yeah okay. and it's very flexible it's okay flexible. You can do whatever. but let's you know open for a chat yeah. I think we can discuss also. yeah hi uh, great presentation um, I have a question about network optimization part because it seems to me that a lot of times when you place these network uh, functions, what you care about is the relationship between these functions. So I want, for example, five millisecond top between these two NFV mm -hmm. VMs that are sitting in different places. You don't necessarily, because uh, telcos have come from that point of view that they want actually to guarantee, sometimes guarantee performance between a set of VMs. 
so east west in the data center. Correct. So what I what I want to ask you is this: uh, first of all, how do you can you explain a little more about how do you work on the network optimization part? What do you exactly are going to get the information from? And the second thing is that do you really think you can have a solution without doing any measurements? Because to me, it seems like unless you can figure out the rack to rack or host to host um, bandwidth. Bandwidth, not bandwidth, actually it's more than that, right? Because uh, you can actually make um, MPLS reservations and then override it and have some more traffic. So where do you exactly, uh, I mean, you, there needs to be some, some sort of feedback loop on what sure. exactly real performance so is. is. Actually, that's a great question. I'll, so I'll break down the answers into two parts. One is the network optimization. With So when you have dependencies between v virtual network functions, you can represent that as a workload uh, uh, topology or a graph or constraints. So the, from the graph, you, uh, you, we can generate these constraints. And therefore, we will be able to incorporate, we have been able to incorporate uh, dependent, uh, uh, I mean, virtual uh, request topologies. Now, to uh, address your concern about uh, how, how do you do measurement and all, and that's where we, uh, so what we've done today till now is using static n network distances. So we assume, our, our, see, our solver is independent of the domain uh, of how you encode the network distance. We just assume that you give us a network distance matrix. Uh, just to go into details. So the way that Neutron can uh, really make this thing into reality is if Neutron has a network distance API by which we could get this virtual traffic, uh, traffic matrix, we will be able to f feed it into the uh, scheduler. But that doesn't exist today. So we had to m do the static thing uh, as a hack to make our uh, the demo to work. Yeah, in, in general, any set of uh, any set of metrics, any, whether it be real time dynamic metrics, uh, can be if as long as they're fed into the into our set of rules uh, which we use while solving the constraint optimization problem. I think uh, that that is all. Ultimately, this is a framework which which yeah. can take in any set of yeah, it's a mathematical solver. solver. That is the idea. Yeah, but how how do you achieve that? We need we need. We, we need, need we need we need monk, uh, we need functions we need functions that provide us the those metrics and uh, th those can be fed into the framework. So just to add, I think um, specifically in the use cases, so that's why you took a use case which is more delay tolerant. The example I explained is more of you know backup or all those services where it's more elastic and you have more flexibility in pre placing um, you know. Uh, your VMs or anything in storage across data centers. Uh, those are the easier ones to tackle versus some hard kind of, you know, you have some latency jitter constraints. So you have to break it down to use case basis and then start addressing these problems. But our do constraints, I mean, do, do model, model, model. But our constraints it's themselves, as Ethi Debo explained, are extremely flexible. Even latency could be a constraint. Anything could be a constraint. So. Gentlemen, commendable job and uh, congratulate you for the at least picking up one piece out of uh, the number of uh, questions for NFEs there. So you have looked at scheduler as one part and enhancing. So there are control plane, data plane separation, then the performance uh, at the network layer uh, and then performance at the storage layer, then the latency and QoS. There is plenty of that. Yes. So given all that, do you not think that we need to have a broader consideration at top down as a NFE API or a API on OpenStack for uh, NFE in per se so that you can address piece by piece and uh, do you think that you will work with uh, other organizations to do that? So, of course, uh, I think it's a very big problem that cannot be solved by uh, a bunch of uh, yeah, go ahead. So, so we were so independent of what API we design at the NFV layer at the higher layer, mm -hmm. the problems that we are trying to tackle will not go away. Yes. So we wanted to Agreed. we wanted to build uh, we wanted to tackle some of the core very fundamental building blocks that will be unchanged because the discussion of the NFV API layer is a huge one, and I don't, we I don't I personally believe that we are not going to have any convergence soon. No, uh, there is no need to be convergence. You can be de yeah. facto. So I, I don't believe that there will be convergence in NFE, in NFE uh, yeah. 6, or NFE 7. So we are happy to work with any uh, yeah. group so of people. So that's what I ask you. Do you yeah, want absolutely. to work with other people to absolutely. get there faster? In fact, uh, just to uh, highlight, we had actually talked about it in this slide. Correct. The application information. That's the open API. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, 
and it's a very broad context and there is you know a lot to do from getting up application information but we zoomed in on specific aspects yeah I, I, I and exactly and so also yeti the project be open be open to work with other uh, competitors Absolutely, and we will yeah, make it so happen completely yeah Thanks. yeah it's completely open no blueprint is one blueprint we need 10 blueprints to make that happen Perfect. So that's the uh, and also to answer your question, it's about the um, augment the server existing server APIs, cross scheduler APIs. That's exactly the proposal. So what are some of the examples of energy constraints? So, for example, um, we have to remember that all you know servers are not equal in energy uh, you know e efficiency. Not, not may not be exactly the same. That's one of the things we'll model, as yes, potentially. So it looks like there are two parts to your presentation. One is the API definition and being able to create the hooks so that you can do what you wanted to do. The other part, which is I think is also massive, is the analytics that uh, that uh, you can build based on uh, based on uh, the data you collect. Right. I just wanted to get an idea, like you know. is are you more focused on the apis right now or more on the analytics or uh, and then there is a follow up question if you yeah so um, uh, as a gr uh, group so we have we are right now not focused on the api per se because we are hoping that the community will jump in and figure out what the right api is we wanted to show to the community using a specific uh, uh, version of the api a very simplified api mm -hmm. so we pushed in some server group api we've uh, we've done some simple scheduling uh, we we basically pushed code for review for an entire framework but uh, and shown some simple examples and in this summit we've shown three talks on how you use analytics to figure out system states and use it for in the context of visualization but we believe that these are small pieces of the same big puzzle but we haven't uh, uh, come up with this big broad api we feel that that's a community process okay so let me ask the question on the analytics uh, i think you showed uh, very quickly i think uh, yathi passed on uh, one of the foil where you had cost function or the performance functions yeah. uh, that is the uh, yeah, have, you, have you have you done a case study where you can share just a quick 30 second some of the accomplishments like right. you know if I you use the hard. cost function Uh, what sort of case study you might have done and uh, proven results or the optimization? Yeah, so um, I, we we can uh, take this offline and okay. show you the exact video, demo videos and the slides we've shown in the summit. Uh, we've had three talks on, but but just to abstract the what what you just asked, yes, we can actually use analytics to find out hotspots and in real time. So imagine you uh, uh, imagine you can find hotspots in real time. You you can actually then use that to give you uh, to, uh, to input a traffic matrix into or a, uh, into the solver scheduler, which then can be used to figure out where your uh, resources should be placed. For example, if you have a, a, a data center with say five racks and you, there is a Hadoop job running in rack three, there is a hotspot which we can identify. independently right now with the analytics we can then have a scheduling constraints that will avoid rack 3 mm -hmm. no, so I, um, in the presentation you had used some numbers uh, just wanted to see like you know what yeah what we can do that offline we have a okay. lot of data that we can share sounds good thank you yeah any other questions okay thank you thank you